welcome to Energy Engineering Distinguished Lecture today. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Yang Sui, uh, from Material Science uh, Engineering and, uh, in uh, Stanford University. Professor Chui received uh, his uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Science and Technology of China in 1998, and he came to Harvard. And he earned his PhD uh, degree in chemistry in 2002, followed by a couple of years of postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley, before he joined uh, Stanford in uh, 2005. Since he joined uh, Stanford, he has been trailblazing the field of uh, nanomaterials and their applications in energy conversion and storage, electronics, biotechnology, and environmental uh, technology. And his research uh, focuses on not only fundamentals of nanomaterials, but also uh, development of uh, low-cost uh, processing to address uh, critical issues in real-world applications. So his uh, uh, efforts and contribution can be easily uh, seen uh, by the H index, which is 174, uh, with total uh, 137,000 citations of the chart. Uh, and his work has been uh, recognized by numerous uh, awards, uh, which I will not spell out in the interest of time. But I would like to point out one thing that he has been quite an entrepreneur. He has founded uh, three companies, Emprium, uh, uh, 4C Air, and DNA Technology, and all of them uh, have been very successful. Uh, so I'll stop here so that you'll have enough time uh, to talk about his uh, research on uh, nanomaterial design for energy. Let's welcome Professor Yishu. Well, thank you, Yong, for the very nice introduction. I would like to thank uh, the Energy uh, System Institute to invite me to come. I'm uh, looking at the audience. Actually, Cornell has a bigger energy crowd than Stanford, so uh, it's a uh, absolutely much too. yeah. <laughs> much, I agree. Today, uh, learning the, about the research, I say, my God, you know, I, I wish I could be a graduate student right here, you know, working for some of the faculty right here. This just made my day. It's really exciting, really exciting, very creative. Uh, I want to spend the next 15 minutes to share with you uh, the, on the topic of energy storage alone. When I was invited, I was ambitious. I put out a, a broader title. Last night, I was preparing my slides. I'm having dinner with Yong. He was a asking me what I, I was going to talk about today. I was still thinking to include the textile research. But there's no way, 15 minutes. I will focus on energy storage, uh, the thinking on the materials interface design. So when I joined in faculty, I mean, this uh, uh, working on energy, it's not really by my design at all. I, I remember when I finished my postdoc 2005 at Berkeley, and Rich and I were in the same lab. I don't know whether you remember my proposal, the faculty proposal. I didn't propose to work on energy really that much. And, uh, but it's a big transition. When I took the job at Stanford, and the last year I was at Berkeley, and Steve Chu moved to Berkeley as a Lawrence Berkeley lab director. So he was encouraging everybody to go into clean energy. I thought, wow, that's a really big challenge we need to solve. And let me risk my career to do so. So going to Stanford, I start energy uh, program. Um, after a number of years, Steve actually come back to Stanford, and we started to collaborate. Uh, 2017, we wrote this perspective and uh, look at uh, about a decade effort, particularly supported by Department of Energy, what has been done. Um, and this review, uh, this is our joint postdoc, Nian, just joining the Georgia Tech faculty uh, uh, recently. Um, this one particular thing is the solar electricity, renewable electricity, the, uh, the price, the cost is going down so fast. We are talking about three cents per kilowatt hour uh, available on average very soon. Certainly in some region of the world, like Saudi Arabia, you are already seeing purchasing price is less than three cents per kilowatt hour. So we could expect, you know, in a, a, a couple of decades, we are talking about one to two cents per kilowatt hour electricity possible. 
Then using electrons to do chemistry, combined with material, become more and more important. So that means catalysis, you know, batteries, fuel cell, all these uh, related technology could be, uh, you know, more and more important. So um, today is uh, I just want to focus on just the battery one. But let's look at where we are right now based on lithium ion. This is the uh, calibration you know, technology I want to use. So if you look at the energy density, 250 watt per kilo, that's roughly in your Tesla car. And can you do double in the cell level? Get to 500 watt per kilo. What it really means is once you get to this energy density for a reasonable size of battery pack in your car, you have 500 miles driving range. So far, Tesla is about 250 miles, 300 miles also. Um, and also, the cell cost needs to go down by a lot, by a lot. Then you need to develop new chemistry in there. And needs to be materials, need to be low cost, abundance, and, and, and so on. This need, need, need to come. And cycle life, about 1,000 cycles in seven years. I mean, I'm using a typical number. You can see some hero number, 3,000 cycle. Uh, can you go to 10,000, 11,000 cycle range, 30 years? So you can really going from car after car retire, take the battery pack and use it for the electrical grid. Charging time, one to two hours typically to 10 to 15 minutes. And we don't know how to do that yet. Even though the silver charge, you know, advertised, let's say 30 minutes somewhere around there, get to get you 80%, but you don't really want to do it so often. You, are, you might be sacrificing your battery uh, life a lot. And eventually from not safe to safe. I mean, all these pl uh, parameters I'm listing right there, their technology parameters looks like very engineering, but indeed this can look back all the way to the science, the understanding of how electrons, ions are moving, and the materials across the interface, and the chemical reaction taking place and so on. So over the past decade or so, my group worked on energy storage. One target is to enhance the energy density going from, let's go from 250 to 500 watt per kilo. Then you need to look into the really new material. Silicon is the one we have been working on for a decade. Lithium metals in the past five years coming up like crazy. And phosphorus is a, a new anode. We recently having a paper coming out and really emphasize how phosphorus can help fast charging. Sulfur cathode is extremely important. If you notice the price of cobalt going up in the past several years, it's going crazy. I mean, for the long term, sulfur will be very, very important. It's low cost, abundant. It can offer high energy and combine with metallic lithium. And then how do you come up with a solid electrolyte, whether it's ceramics or the polymer, that can enable a uh, you know, safer battery operation, can help uh, uh, lithium metal as well. And, and so we need characterization tool to understand how the battery work. And we look at the whole list of this topic right there. My group is working on, I also, you know, uh, notice in Conair, you guys have an excellent group working on a number of different topics right there, ranging from, you know, lithium metal, from the electrolyte, from basic electrochemistry, to the new tool of characterization. Uh, and that really made my day today and learning about the exciting activity right here. So let me start by uh, 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 looking into the high energy materials. What's the material design needed, right? If you look at the graphite right here, moving uh, away from graphite to silicon, you have 10 times higher capacity to lithium metal, about 10 times higher. And positive electro, moving from this uh, transition metal oxide, lithium base, to sulfur. And these uh, new high capacity materials show one thing, that is, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you the challenge la uh, later, but this is the roadmap pos possibly enable 250 watt per kilo right now. If you could make silicon to work combined with this, uh, 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 you know, we call MMC, right? This gets you somewhere around 500. And lithium metal coming in with MMC, uh, you know, this 400 go to 500 and then potentially 600 and above. But to make that happen, and the material thinking and interface thinking needs to change. And the traditional host materials, we know it holds lithium ion coming in, whether it's graphite or lithium cobalt oxide. And these host materials are stable. There's really no chemical bond breaking right there in the host material through intercalation in and out very nicely, very gentle. And the host, new host materials store so many more lithium ions. You have no choices. You're dumping in so many lithium ions, so many electrons, you're chopping down the chemical bond. 
inside these house materials. And the house atoms will need to move because of significant bonding change, large volume expansion, right? complete structural change. You are talking about 10 times or more volume change compared to traditional materials. These are the challenges we have to face. How do you design the materials to overcome those completely different paradigms of change and the nanoscale what, and the interface and the whole electron and the cell scale? So now let me share with you the first learning we have. We started is on silicon. And uh, I remember, still remember, I was a young faculty, junior faculty at Stanford. I was uh, hiring my first graduate student. One night I was learning about battery. I didn't know about battery at all when I joined the faculty. I didn't tell her about that, <laughs> by the way. I was telling her, I have a great idea. Let's work on that. So I go to the library, I read about this. I teach her tomorrow, right, the next day. And then next day I learn a little bit more. I come back to teach her a little bit more. That's how we, she also teach me as well. And mutually, we are growing in the same time. I was telling my student, this is Joe, but I think mean, that's absolutely true. If you're joining a assistant professor's lab, you are joining a leaking boat. <laughs> you need to all work very hard at the same time, otherwise you sink together. I told my students about that. So they kind of like it, because uh, they know professor needs to work as hard as they would need to do. So that's, we, we started to do that together. So silicon volume expand 10 times, right? This uh, is four times, sorry, and then it's going to break. And then this break can cause a lot of problem. If you break, you lose electrical contact, you expose large surface area. And the second thing is the solid electrolyte interface, each of these particles will react with organic electrolyte and end potential is so low, a lot of reduction power. If you have volume expansion and contraction keeps going, you don't have a stable interface. So how do you cycle these batteries? So we started from this one. I, uh, for me, it's not too hard to come up with this idea. Some of you know I work for Lieber as a graduate student. I know how to grow nanowires very well. I told my first graduate student, Candace Chen, I said, Candace, let's make some silicon nanowires. Probably we can solve the breaking problem. Smaller guys don't break that easily, right? So we come up with this hypothesis. It grows uh, uh, on the current collector. And this is connected with current collector. So you can relax the strain, it, don't, it, it, it doesn't break and you maintain, maintain electrical contact. So it turns out it works. We see uh, it's a lot more stable compared to before. Uh, this is the paper probably get me tenure and stay at Stanford after that. So, uh, so over the years, we have been thinking about what's really that perfect material we need. We know silicon needs to be small enough, otherwise it will break. And then we come up core shell structure. Having a stable core and a shell of silicon, this helps stabilize <coughs> silicon. So this is good. And we think about, thought about hollow structure. Hollow have an interior space, can relax the strain fast. This also help. But none of this design can solve one problem. That's a very difficult one. If you keep having volume expansion towards outside, facing electrolyte, you are not having a stable interface. You can build that inter interfacial layer. That's really tough. That uh, really uh, bothered me for several years. Until this publication, I come up with this idea. What about I make a double wall hollow structure? The blue is silicon. The, uh, the, uh, the red color is actually silicon oxide, mechanically very strong, confines silicon, volume expansion towards inside, inside or outside. Inside have this hollow space. So outer surface never move. So this stabilizes silicon. We see that this cycle is like 6,000 cycles with stability. After this, I say, well, I'm convinced silicon will be able to go into industry. Breaking problem is solved if they're small enough, and then you can build stable interface. The rest becomes uh, how do you make them low cost and then with high yield for the industry to use. So we have been through this now 12th generation. So I won't go into the detail of that, don't worry. So uh, indeed, uh, 2008, I found the Amperes, and that was about 11 years ago. Uh, I was uh, a little bit struggling whether I should do a startup company. You know, I didn't have tenure yet, but somehow after VC talked to me uh, a number of times, I was convinced maybe I should do it. Let, let me learn how to start up a company. So they, they taught me about this. We raised uh, uh, roughly now $150 million. Now there's two product line on the market. One is and this 750 watt per liter, 290 watt per kilo. Right, remember the Tesla one is about 250, 260. Adding a little bit of silicon into graphite, you boost up the, that to 300. 
If 750 watt per liter for your cell phone, I give you a number. It's about 650 to 700 watt per liter, so we are higher. But the line two, this one is uh, incredible. This one is using silicon nanowires. This one actually we are supplying the battery to the Airbus, the commercial drone, the Cyphers S. This one having uh, 435 watt per kilo, 1200 watt per liter, very high energy. This allowed Airbus to break the world record, 25 days continuous flying on the uh, elevation, at the elevation of 70,000 feet, no stopping. This combines solar cells and store the electricity for about six hours. The rest of 18 hours rely on batteries. That's why you need very high energy density. So this is a, a, a start to get into commercial uh, world uh, very fast. So after I found the Amplius, so my silicon program, I have to slowly phase out, now keeping a small program right there. Uh, continue doing that. A few other things I see there's still scientific problem I, I have to overcome. So what's next? This is the exciting opportunity. So two years ago, White House announced Battery 500 program. It's for uh, how do you develop 500 watt per kilo of batteries. And silicon will not be able to, to do that as an anode. We need to work on metallic lithium. This is co-led by PNNL National Lab and Stanford and Slack. And June is the director, I serve as the co-director. I noticed Stan is coming, Stan Whittingham, on your energy day. Stan is one of our PI, uh, core PI in, in the team right there. In order to make 500 watt per kilo of batteries, we need to work on metallic lithium. Lithium sulfur is one of the technology uh, uh, choice to uh, uh, get us uh, 500 watt per kilo. Another one is lithium metal together with high nickel MMC. So both technology path require us to work on metallic lithium. I want to spend most of my time, let's look at metallic lithium. What's the challenge right there? How do we design materials for metallic lithium? So this is the problem. <laughs> um, we learn from literature, also from my own group's research. I mean, right here, uh, uh, Lyndon Archer's group is working very actively on metallic lithium, having a lot of great work uh, coming out. So this is the one, you know, met lithium metal uh, with uh, interface with electrolyte, liquid electrolyte, forming the SEI, solid electrolyte interface. If you do the plating, you know, metal plating process, it's very hard to control. You can get layer by layer, very flat plating. That would be really hard to do. Uh, then you cause the surface curvature change. This causes the cracking of your interfacial layer, SEI. If you have the crack right here, that's where the deposition, current density will focus on that, easily grow out of filamental structure. This can grow out and show the batteries, so-called dendrite. When you say dendrite, usually it's dendritic, but now people mix up fil filament and dan dendritic structure, calling just one term, kind of wire type of structure. When you do stripping during the battery discharge, and there's no guarantee it could go from top to bottom, it might just uh, strip from the bottom. Then you are going to disconnect this filament. You are losing lithium all the time. And over cycle, before too long, you know, the battery already lose so much. And this high surface area of lithium react with organic electrolyte, you consume electrolyte so fast. So you have to remember to make a real battery, you need about three milliamp hour per centimeter square or higher capacity. That's equivalent to 15 micron thick of lithium if they are flat and dense. So every time you play 15 micron, you strip 15 micron. This up and down per layer, it's just too much. How do you build stable interface? There's no way. So looking at this, you know, as a you know, Chinese, uh, probably as a Korean as well, you like to draw something like this. You say, well, down to the bottom, what's the cause? What's the root causes right there? So there's two right here. High chemical reactivity of, uh, chemical reactivity of lithium. And also this relative volume change it's infinite, going to fill state, to empty states completely. This change is too dramatic. The rest are the phenomena. You see the bad things taking place. So in order to solve all this problem, let's come up with a solution for the root causes first. So we built a research program. Steve come back to Stanford in 2013, and uh, we have a really nice chat. We say, what was the most important material we work on? We all identify metallic lithium. We got to solve this problem. So we need to build stable interface, overcome the high chemical reactivity issue. 
And a few years ago, we come up with this idea. We say, well, people use lithium metal foil all the time, which you learn from graphite. You need a host hosting lithium. In the graphite case, you're hosting atomically thin of lithium atoms right there. Here, we want to host metallic lithium between the layer, between the host materials. Then you can stabilize the whole electrical structure. Now, let, let me share with you some of this learning. And all the way looking back to the you know, very fundamental material science, right? The first question we ask is, how does the lithium nucleation take place? When you play lithium, you know, they got to nucleate somewhere. If you have lithium foil, that's one case. You can also have copper foil right there. That's heterogeneous nucleation. If you have a copper foil, you deposit lithium. You say, I want to dry my lithium deposition with different over potential. That is also different current density. Higher current density you use a higher over potential. Then classical uh, heterogeneous nucleation theory teaches us the radius of the nuclei will go down if you increase the over potential. But the number density will go up as the function of Q. That's classical nucleation theory is teaching us. Then we say we drive this nucleation using different current density from low to high. And then this is what you expect to happen. And low over potential, you have smaller number, but each nuclei will be bigger. But in the high current density, you will have a lot of nuclei, they will be a lot smaller, right? We actually map out this. This is a, a nuclear size, you know, with the current density increase, you see the, uh, um, the uh, radius, the size is decreased. It's uh, one over, over potential relationship. These are some of the images, and in the low current density, to higher and higher and even higher, you see the number density right here is increased, but it, it will look a lot smaller. We actually go in and count it in a few hundreds of those uh, particles and confirm this is really the uh, you know, heterogeneous nucleation. The theory describes this uh, case very well. Now with this, right, if you look at a copper, you want to deposit lithium electrochemically and you monitor the potential that deposition happen, but you have a nucleation barrier right there, this overshooting of potential, nucleation happen, and then the deposition happen. You have about 40 milliwatt of over potential after nucleation coming back to the plating. This is on copper, and the very low current density of 10 microamp per centimeter square. And then if you look at a substrate like gold, it's very different. Lithium coming in, alloy with gold, you see a plateau, I'm telling you it's forming an alloy phase. You have a little bit of over potential, the second alloy phase, and then lithium metal deposition happened right here. But there's no nucleation barrier right there. We look at this, we say, wow, that's different. Let's see what's going on between copper and lithium and gold and lithium. Uh, it's very handy, actually, the first thing you check is phase diagram in material science. And you look at gold and lithium, Let's look at the right-hand side. It turned out to be gold has solubility and lithium. You know, if you have gold right here, you keep adding lithium, right? You are walking from phase diagram from left to right, and you form an alloy phase somewhere in the middle, a second alloy phase at room temperature. And then this lithium atom coming in, having the ability to dissolve all the gold atoms away. You make gold more and more look like lithium before lithium deposition take place. So there's no over potential because gold is completely look like lithium. But between copper and lithium, copper has no solubility in lithium. Copper is FCC, different atomic size, different lattice constant, lithium is BCC. It's a very different crystal structure right there. So lithium nuclear on copper has over potential. Using this idea, let's screen a bunch of materials. And this is gold, silver, zinc, magnesium. You see, they all we shift the voltage curve up so you can see it clearly. They don't have over potential. If you go look at the phase diagram, these metals, they can all be dissolved in lithium. And then you look at something like copper, nickel, carbon. They have no solubility in lithium. They have over potential right there. So with this idea, we say, well, we could do some, something right now allow us to control where lithium will go, right? You know, if you form dendrite, dendrite will grow, you, you lose control. But we want to first of all spatially control lithium deposition. So we design an experiment. This is a copper substrate with gold line pattern. And then you deposit lithium electrochemically. You see the lithium all go onto the gold line and grow from right there. They don't want, they don't like copper at all. Of course, this is under the, 
you know, current density, you cannot drive too high current density. If it's too high current density, your over potential will be too big to drive that. And then you lose the control whether it's uh, gold or copper. And here is about, we can get about 0.5 milliamp per centimeter square current density also to see this. With this idea, we could realize spatial deposition, spatial control of lithium metal deposition. Now we could design a host to say lithium going into this structure, don't go anywhere else, right? We, now we design a hollow carbon sphere. Inside, we'll have this gold nanoparticle as seed. For demonstration, we use gold, that's expensive, but we don't have to use gold. Your magnesium, zinc, you know, we, we showed that it can also work just for convenience. So if you grow this amorphous carbon, you have particles in there, now you do electrochemical deposition, and lithium will need to decide, uh, uh, decide does that position will happen outside or inside? But because inside has seeds easy to nuclear, our hypothesis is under reasonable current density, not too high, we can get lithium deposition in there instead of outside. So we made this structure using a templated method, silicon dioxide and then particle coated, carbon coated and dissolve silicon oxide away. So this carbon shell has a nanometer holes then you know, aqueous solution, HF, can come in and actuate silicon oxide. But we don't want this hole to be too big. If it's too big, when you build the batteries, the organic electrolyte can also come in. That's what we don't want. So we need to do a good, good job in getting this uh, carbon layer without big pin, pinholes right there. So we made this happen. Kai was a postdoc in my group. And having this uh, particle, you know, dark color, uh, inside this hollow carbon, then you say, well, what's the ideal number of uh, uh, gold you want to have? We didn't have experience. Let's say, let's just throw, you know, tens of them in there. Uh, apparently, and your current density, your power density, the charging speed depends on certain degree, how many gold particles you have in there. The more you have, more nucleation you have, that's better, right? So now let me show you. This is in situ TEM. We do that position inside this hollow carbon to convince you lithium has this ability to dissolve gold away. This is a gold particle. You see this is hollow carbon. Now we place some lithium in there. You see gold get dissolved away. And then you can also strip lithium out and see how the gold will, will, will come back. This is stripping now. You see this gold particle comes back. So confirming our idea of uh, why gold can function as a really nice seed. So with this, we actually build a real battery electrode. These are the particles, with gold particles seeds in the hollow carbon. And then you deposit lithium. You don't really see that over potential. Now you can deposit certain capacity right there. You don't really see lithium, metal, filament growing outside. You don't see that. But if you only have hollow carbon alone, you see this filamental structure jumping out. Uh, so the bottom case will be a lot more stable because now carbon sphere functions as interfacial layer, isolating metallic lithium from the organic electrolyte. You have a host hosting metallic lithium right there. So they don't just grow randomly doing all the bad things. So with this understanding, then we ask the question, is this amorphous carbon the best? What about you turn amorphous carbon become graphitic? So we, t we take a nickel uh, particle, and then we can deposit some gold nanoparticle right there, and then uh, react with organic sources, heat it up 450 degrees. It's very well developed. Nickel is a catalyst, can grow graphene. And then we grow this graphene layer. There's still some pinhole right there, and then we you know, etch away the uh, nickel in there. Now we have a graphitic carbon. The reason graphitic carbon is good, you know, graphitic carbon is very resilient mechanically. If you have amorphous carbon hollow sphere, you press on it, it can break so easily. Now with graphitic carbon, you can press on it. You know, it will be still stable. So mechanically, that's a good thing. You know, when you build a battery, your anode and cathode and separator need to press together. This will allow you to do that. So now with this, right, we uh, plate lithium in there. This is empty one. If you cut the cross section, you can see it. You play lithium in there, you can see lithium filling the space inside this uh, graphitic carbon, but there will be a limit. You know, we can control that to be about three milliamp hour or five milliamp hour per centimeter square. 
So this is good, you know, lithium metal deposit inside. What's surprising to us is, you know, my student keep plating this. Beyond five milliamp hour, go to 10 milliamp hour per centimeter square. You deposit so much more lithium metal, and this interior space cannot hold. And then it will start to blow out. But to our surprise, this doesn't, maybe this one looks uh, uh, better. Right here, this lithium plating forming this cross section wise, very dense layer right there. We don't see the dendritic growth. You know, I was expecting if you have plating outside, you are going to see lithium dendrite. But somehow we don't see that. Now outside, we don't have the seeds anymore. We don't have the gold seeds anymore. Lithium will just plating onto graphitic carbon. That's something we still need to understand more, why it can play so nicely. So all these nice plating translate into this blue curve, so-called columbic efficiency. If you play lithium and stripping, you know, how many you can get out. The columbic efficiency is much higher, more stable, less reaction with the electrolyte. So this just keeps going. And then the next question we also ask, we know we are going to have pinhole on the wall of carbon, whether it's graphitic or not. But if you have pinhole, your synthesis, you are not careful. If your pinhole are big, and then, you know, electrolyte can leak in. You know, this is one of the case you can expect with this pinhole right there, you put in electrolyte, now electrolyte goes inside, so that's not good. So what we want is, even with pinhole, we can seal the pinhole. So then we started to use the uh, technique called atomic layer deposition, ALD. Even with pinhole, we coat it with a layer of uh, aluminum oxide. Then you seal the pinhole, electrolyte will not come in. Then you can do the deposition inside because lithium ion can diffuse through this aluminum oxide, no problem. Lithium ion is very small, very powerful. You know, very few material can block the lithium ion diffusion. So we actually made a whole electrode of hollow carbon and seal it with ALD, right? And then one experiment we were trying is to, to prove this is good. If you have pinhole right there, for example, you add in sodium chloride, a salt, aqueous solution, you dip it in, and then you are going to see lithium, sorry, the sodium chloride deposition uh, inside of this hollow carbon if you cut a cross section. With ALD coating, you cut it open, you rarely see you know, the sodium chloride deposition inside. This is telling you the electrolyte will not get in if you can do the sealing. So with this, you know, you can see you know, this uh, stability of electro when you do charging, discharging, columbic efficiency measurement can last much, much longer now. So this is uh, uh, still going, but eventually to build a battery electro, electrochemical storing of lithium metal into a hose will be too high cost. We say we need to invent a new processing. We can build a battery electro. You know, that already stored lithium inside a host. So several years ago, my group started to develop, the first time, the molten lithium infusion method into the host. Uh, Ding Chang just joined in Harvard as a postdoc, and, and Yao Yuan just joined in MIT as a postdoc recently. So, but the first thing we try, once you melt, molten, uh, melt the lithium, right, forming molten lithium right there, and you see these uh, lithium balls stay. They don't like to wet this carbon, you know, and we start to see, wow, that's uh, something I haven't seen before because rarely people melt lithium this way, so we did that. But make sure you do it in a glass box, right? Don't do it outside. <laughs> <laughs> Your boss will be very mad at you if you do it outside. Uh, so until we try graphene oxide, it melts, it actually goes in. This, it's probably better. Look at the other screen. Apparently, this wetting phenomenon right there, right? I mean, for water, you have hydrophobic, hydrophilic, so we call a new term called uh, lithophilic and lithophobic. Now, it's only this paper come out only for about three years, less than three years. Turned out to be this has become a lithium battery community, one of the most popular terms right now called lithophilic, lithophobic. So we call this new term. So the reason, well, uh, let me show you the video first to convince you and then to tell you the reason. You put graphene oxide through this filtration, this layer, into the molten lithium, you see a spark coming out. Um, the spark reaction generates this gas, open up the gap between the graphene oxide to tens to hundreds of nanometers. And then graphene oxide has a lot of polar functional group. And uh, react with lithium metal, the delta G of reaction gives free energy is negative. Now you soak it into molten lithium, you see this bright spot. You know, start to have capillary force pulling this molten lithium 
going between the graphene oxide, before long the whole thing becomes this golden color, lithium metal embedded between layer graphene oxide. So the reason I mentioned is graphene oxide surface has this OH, COH bonding. We have with metallic lithium. It is a delta G driving force right there. You have a wetting surface for metallic lithium, the molten lithium. But the graphene one, no distangling bond, very inert. It's you, so you cannot wet this lithium unless you go to extremely high temperature. You know, that, that, then things start to work in a different way. So with 8% graphene oxide in there, you can build a structure right, like this. It embedded a uh, uh, molten lithium you know, inside the graphene oxide. Imagine now you take this structure. You say, I'm going to do lithium stripping during the battery charge. You take out lithium from the side, the top and bottom surface forming the solid electrolyte interface. As long as you don't take 100% lithium out, there's always a, li a little bit of lithium domain inside. You can hold the thickness, the volume right there. Then you have a stable structure you can build interface, uh, solid electrolyte interface to make it more stable. So we confirm that, you know, this is a very ductile, can be processed using the traditional battery uh, processing equipment. Then out using this current density, three milliamp, one milliamp per centimeter square, you play lithium, and then now you don't see the dendrite formation. So we show that this become a lot more stable if you play lithium, you know, strip lithium using this type of host structure. Then we also ask the question, what's the ideal host right there? So we have looked into different choices, ranging from polymer uh, uh, nanofiber network, you know, we have porous metal foam, and uh, we have silicon oxide, aluminum fluoride, you overreact, put in more lithium in there. It will generate lithium fluoride, lithium oxide, now metallic lithium domain will embed into this framework of lithium oxide and fluoride they become much more stable. Not only that, with this metallic lithium structure embedded three-dimensionally, you can handle much higher current density, potentially for fast charging. We're talking about 10 milliamp to 20 milliamp per centimeter square. Now with this 3D lithium, uh, it, it's, it's, doing, it's doing better. So this is the host structure. Then we say, well, even with host, what does the host really do? Your 15 micron plating of lithium, right, for three milliamp per centimeter square, up and down. You make it three dimensionally localized. Those, uh, you know, dimension change going from 15 micron become maybe one micron or less. We actually, virtually, we want to get down to having a stable interface. Don't you don't have localized volume change either? Then you can build stable SEI. We will need to have a very stable interface right there for lithium. What's the criteria? Lithium is so reactive. So we look at this in 2014, we say we need a amorphous carbon. It's uh, electronically not so conducting, chemically stable, mechanically strong enough. So we look at that, we see a great progress uh, by doing a, a carbon sphere, but that's not good enough. Then we look at boron nitride. Boron nitride is completely inert to lithium, but boron nitride have this uh, the graphene type of structure, even lithium, Iron cannot go through. Then you need pond defect. Boron nitride, you have, can have nitrogen vacancy right there. Pond defect, you know, lithium can go through. And you can add in the uh, uh, electrolyte additive. That will build an inorganic coating to help you. You know, that's another way. And together with Steve Chu, we also come up with the idea. What about we use diamond, nano diamond made by CVD, bilayer. And it's very strong, chemically also stable. We also see the improvement. So this learning just going on and on and on. And, um, and I won't go into the detail of that. But let me uh, try to share with you. Um, and uh, so to go to high energy, and lithium metal is important, but sulfur is equally important, right? Sulfur for the long term, the, the low cost potential right there, it's very important. Sulfur can enable very high storage capacity. But during this charge and charging, you have this polysulfide phase. That's a, a, a solvent that's soluble in the electrolyte. And then you lose control where the active materials are. So this huge number of problem building up. Uh, and uh, my group has been doing encapsulation idea for a number of years, utilize polysulfide and, and so on. But this just continue uh, going. I know in Cornell right here, there's multiple group. You guys are doing great job and working on, on sulfur. So I won't repeat that. But I really want to come to this point. 
You know, material design is one thing. The uh, really the understanding of the material interface need to go hand in hand. This uh, during research, we find out just a lot of things we don't understand. We need to come up new technique so we can understand how things happen uh, inside the batteries. You know, battery for a long time has uh, been considered as a black box in there. It looks really simple, a positive electric and a negative electric and an electric. It looks really simple, but it's actually very complicated in there. So first thing I want to highlight with you, this is a recent study. Uh, Steve and I have a joint uh, battery subgroup. We meet about monthly, like for a few hours. And Steve said, I want to look at everything on the optical microscope. I said, I say, Steve, I know. Yeah, you do everything on the optical microscope. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right? I don't know what's, what to expect. So we build this uh, lateral cell, right, this lithium metal. This is uh, you know, 50 to 100 nanometer evaporated metal. This electrolyte right here. With uh, containing polysulfide. What we want to do is we want to deposit sulfur and strip it away, right? Uh, kind of this process deposition and dissolve it away and see how the sulfur look. You know, uh, uh, at the beginning of the hypothesis is uh, I know the metal will have some catalytic effect affecting polysulfide reaction. I want to look for that. But turn out to be we discovered something completely unexpected. So I want to show you this video. <laughs> This is the pattern of a nickel line right there, right? Um, and then we deposit sulfur in there electrochemically. And now as soon as you see this, you say, well, during that position, this sulfur forming this droplet, now you're dissolving sulfur away. And then you deposit that again. First of all, they look like round shape. It's a spherical shape. Uh, you see the sulfur grows. I say, well, this seems to indicate sulfur is liquid, right? But we know sulfur's melting point is 115 degrees Celsius. At room temperature, you're so much below room temperature, you have super cooling. So this Steve becomes very exciting. If you know Steve's past history, he won the Nobel Prize for super cooling of atom. Once the super cool appear and his radar screen, Steve just gets so excited. So we need to continue. <laughs> uh, so first of all, let's look at Raman. We look at sulfur powder, solid. And then we look at this droplet doing Raman right there. The signal more or less look like the same. That's sulfur A molecule right there. It's not those uh, polysulfide we've seen. First of all, we need to make sure that uh, this sulfur is uh, the uh, sulfur eight. Then you say, yeah, what's really happening? Is this uh, a, a experimental artifact right there? And uh, then let's look at more right, before we convince that's a liquid. right? So we look at palladium, platinum, ITO, and cobalt sulfide, this patterning. You all see this spherical structure right there. I mean, this is really weird. I worked on sulfur battery for about a decade. I never knew sulfur at room temperature is liquid. It's a super cool like this. And then you say, well, is this, uh, what about carbon, right? I mean, I, you know, in the past, I look at so many sulfur. That's after the fact, I deposit sulfur, and then I kind of, let it dry. I go look at under SEM pumping on vacuum. I mean, look at look, look like solid. I never I never saw, saw liquid. And now with carbon right there, if you grow this, so let's look at this. It's more clear. And you see this now sulfur deposition coming out uh, on this rough carbon surface. You do see this uh, sulfur growing out like a, like a solid. So this is uh, telling us, you know, it's not our setups or uh, error or anything. So it's, that's real. And we also confirm the sulfur droplet, they can merge. They are droplet, they are liquid. If they come closer, they merge, become a big one within about a millisecond also. It just merge so fast, right? So let me also convince you um, this is a liquid. And also, there's something going on. This sulfur droplet, it does not like to wet this nucleation barrier on nickel. They don't really like nickel that much. They actually bore out on nickel surface. The contact angle is really big right there. But we, we were able to uh, generate a crystalline uh, uh, sulfur right there and let it grow electrochemically in there. And then this will grow towards a, a sulfur droplet. And then once it touched that like a golden finger, right? everything becomes solidified. <laughs> now this is convinced you, now you have a seed, then it will start to grow you know, solid out of it, crystal out of that. So, so apparently this uh, super cooling is due to very hard to nucleate a, a solid, a crystalline at the first place on this uh, nickel. 
uh, electrical surface. I mean, my students are having fun, you know, they, uh, let, let, I need to play this video for you to see. Right. So once this sulfur touching this one, it becomes solid, and then this will grow and touch and just keep touching. <laughs> this reminds me, I grew up in China when I was a little kid in, in the winter time, you have this uh, fruit, you know, some of Chinese must know called Tang Hu Lu, right? It's just uh, having a, a ball of uh, fruit, you know, linked together by, uh, by, by something. So just keep going. Um, so apparently, this is a pathway I think we, we propose. Uh, the past understanding has been you have an electro, you have polysulfide, and then you charge out your battery. This pick up two electron becomes sulfur eight directly. Right? Polysulfide becomes sulfur eight is a solid. Now, right now, you pick up these two electrons, you generate sulfur eight. Sulfur eight has a little bit of solubility, very small, but a little bit. The sulfur eight molecule going to the, your electrolyte, and then nuclear and grow into sulfur. But on these uh, nickel surface, electro surface, and the nucleation barrier is so high, this contact angle is really big right there. It's almost a perfect sphere shape. And so they like to grow into the sulfur droplet. Uh, and this, this just keep going. Then what's the implication of this discovery? We found out with the sulfur state in the liquid state, it's a lot more reversible. If it becomes solid, and then you want to do this charge, and it's much harder compared to the liquid. We're trying to design an electrical wire. Now let's keep soft in the liquid state during the battery charging discharging. And this might be possible. We actually did one experiment and say how super cool you can super cool this sulfur droplet. We go down to minus 40 degrees Celsius, still liquid. So that's a big surprise. We are talking to our condensed matter physics colleague. They say, well, they studied the glassy state, right? This is a super cool phenomenon for a long time. The prediction was the maximum super cool you can do is about the temperature delta T. It's about one third of the melting point. We already exist one third of the melting point of sulfur. So they're trying to come up with theory to explain this. Stay tuned on that. So this is one thing, right? Seeing is believing. You need to see what happened. So for a long time, I also wanted to see atomic scale structure on the component inside the batteries. If you do lithium ion battery, you know many of the components are not stable. As soon as you focus under the beam, you destroy them. It's very hard to get atomic scale resolution. So several years ago, um, we uh, tried to hire a faculty at Stanford right there. I was reading the file with this faculty joining uh, Stanford uh, later. La that it, it was last year. But when I was reading his file, I said, well, I didn't know the cryo EM has advanced so much, right? And uh, I said, well, this is super exciting. And I thought this could be a technique, you know, to study our battery problem. And I told my students, uh, usually when you have a good idea, very risky, you find the best students to work on it. I mean, that's the rule. Uh, uh, I asked these two students, I said, well, guys, stop what you are doing right now. Let's work on the cryo EM. <laughs> <laughs> well, he already has a nature energy paper published. I said, your PhD defense is all set. You don't have to worry about it. So <laughs> let's do this. So then we developed this. I mean, it's not easy. I have to uh, call up uh, Roger Combert, I mean, our colleague in biology. He has a cryo EM right there. I said, Roger, can you help me? You know, send one of you guys to help us to develop this. Roger is very generous and help us. But we still need to come up how we prepare the sample. So we deposit lithium metal, dendrite, on this TM grid. And then, so put it, uh, uh, plunge freeze into liquid nitrogen without exposed to air at all. At liquid nitrogen temperature, lithium metal just doesn't react with uh, anything there. And uh, under liquid nitrogen temperature, temperature, transfer this into the TEM and look at this. So you all know this is a cryo EM technique and 2017 is a, a, a Nobel winning technique uh, in biology, winning the chemistry prize. So we learn a lot from, from that. So the essence of cryo EM is number one is the direct electron detector. So you don't have to use a, a you know, high dose to get the image. That's how you can image your protein uh, uh, molecules. Uh, and then we can see this dendrite right there. Uh, and then the first time I look at this, I mean, it just looks like the contrast is too light. Is it really something right there? And the right hand side, this image is the one under the standard TEM with one second air exposure, just you know, regular room temperature TEM. They're not stable, they look like black color, it's already re react with uh, air, forming lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, lithium oxide, lithium nitride, and so on. And then if you zoom in, you're going to drill a hole right there. Now with cryo condition, we can you know, look at 10 minutes, they're still stable. We are counting out those. 
and this electron dose rate of 50, 50 electrons per angstrom square per second. If you look at biology, typically you are talking about you need to get the image under 10 electrons per angstrom square in total. So actually lithium metal is a lot more robust. This allows us, you know, we also look at the uh, eels and we're confirming it's metallic lithium is not ionic lithium state and getting the uh, atomic scale resolution of lithium metal. But it actually took a long time to convince the community. I mean, the paper review takes ni uh, took nine months to, to do. And you can you really see lithium. Lithium is considered not stable. And uh, we have to explain that. Eventually, uh, uh, people are convinced. And in the battery field, is a really exciting you know, uh, uh, component called SEI. We want to know atomic scale resolution of that, but it wasn't possible, right? I mean, it's just so fragile. In the battery field, there are two models called mosaic or layer model, one proposed by Palais, the other by Dolan Arba. Palais said, this is having the nano grain patched together, forming this mosaic SEI. You know, SEI is important, control lithium coming in and out. You want to block electron, but not lithium. But you need to know its structure. And Doron says multi-layer with inorganic layer, and then the top is a, a lot of organics right there. So with the cryo EM, we could resolve for the first time, this is metallic lithium right there. This is interfacial uh, a layer. This is SEI. If you go in, this is more clear. You can identify each grain of uh, like lithium oxide, lithium carbonate right there. This is under the carbonate electrolyte. Seems to confirm the mosaic model of domains of these uh, materials patched together, but it's slightly, just slightly different from what uh, Palais proposed. This is more like a matrix type of thing. Um, and then as soon as the electrolyte and this ECDs, you add in 10% of FEC, you see this SEI structure change completely. Right? You see this SEI amorphous layer right here. This is metallic lithium dendrite growing this way. On the top, you see a really nice inorganic coating layer. This is a multi-layer model. But it's slightly different from what Doron proposed. Doron proposed is inorganic should be in the bottom, but actually we see the inorganic on the top. Um, so with this understanding, and this becomes more and more exciting, how, could you, how can you correlate this SEI with the battery performance? So during the process of the, uh, 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 you know, um, these uh, uh, cryo-EM development, Certainly, I started to see, wow, this exciting work going on right here. Helena and is, is doing that, and this nature paper coming out very nice. And, it's, uh, and UCSD also, Shirley Meng is uh, seeing something right there. This turned out to be, I think, a very exciting time in the next uh, number of years of uh, having a cryo EM technique to look at materials. This opened up a huge opportunity you can think about. So with one last minute, uh, just telling you you know, related. Now we say, well, with this SEI, well, who cares? You know, different structure, right? Let's look at this. With ECDC, you have this mosaic and matrix model. If you play lithium, they look like this. And if uh, you add an FEC electrode, it's multi-layer SEI, you play lithium, they more or less look the same. But once you strip it halfway, they look very different. And, and the mosaic one, you kind of like a long lithium dendrite now cut into half. And this uh, uh, multi-layer one will just be a long danger uniformly diameter gets thinner. Well, that's very different. And then electrochemistry-wise, we notice a huge difference in its performance. With the uh, ECDC alone, you only have 80% chromatic efficiency. You charge 100 electrons, you only get 80 out, right? And then once we look at this, we do lithium stripping halfway. Now we see this notch formation. If we zoom in the notch, we find out this inorganic particle concentration is very high. Apparently, having this high concentration of inorganic particle right here, lithium ion conductivity is much higher. When you do stripping, this is the place stripped really fast. And then this causes the pinch off. If we pinch off, the bottom gets stripped away, and the top will be disconnect from the current collector. You have that lithium formation. That's why you lose so much lithium, right? And then for the uh, uniform one, these uh, uh, layer SEI, you see uniform stripping becomes thinner. So columbic efficiency is 95%. You only lose 5% of that. That 5% due to you need to form SEI, you lose 5%. So this is really good. Now cryo-EM is teaching us this can make a huge difference. Unfortunately, for both either of cases, the second time you deposit lithium, 
This lithium metal does not like to go into this initial empty shell. It will push out this empty shell and deposit underneath. So that's why lithium metal chromic efficient first cycle, second cycle, you know, it just never get to 99% and above. Very, very hard to, to get, uh, get to 99%. You just keep every cycle need to reform the SEI, consume too much lithium. I call lithium as a very expensive kid. So every home, every time, every night, lithium come home and tell daddy and mommy, and say, I want a different house to stay in. That's what lithium is doing. So every, every time, lithium is asking for that. It's, I think I need to wrap up, so the time is running out, even though it's, I believe it's uh, interesting, but uh, <laughs> sorry guys, you have to invite me back again. <laughs> so, well, let me uh, come to the last slide. Is, uh, this is really exciting, you know. We know, I mean, battery fuel industry is growing, roughly double the whole industry every two to three years. I mean, it's an exciting time. The electric car is driving the, this whole, whole thing. And uh, also, green scale storage is coming up. And as a graduate student, postdocs, and young faculties working with electrochemistry, it's just wonderful. <laughs> and this is a lot of fundamental uh, 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 questions you need to answer in order to enable a roadmap like this. Uh, let me end my talk by thanking the whole research group and DOE for the funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.